Hello folks, hope you're doing well, hope everything's going well in your lives and everything's progressing well. Right now I'm probably away with the missus on a trip, having a good time uh, somewhere in the UK. Hopefully it's sunny, but we, we never know in this country. So I just realised it is Mental Health Awareness Month in May, which I, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who ever usually gets embroiled in these awareness months right you know um i don't do international women's day or men's day or whatever i i, I just don't I, I see it as an empty gesture um i'm the kind of guy who by the way if you're looking for normal hobby content this ain't gonna be it as you can tell from the title of this video um in terms of when the pandemic was going on we we, we in the uk had you know, a, a, a huge drive to show the NHS a lot of appreciation and support. And whilst I thought that was great, there was also a big part of me that said, well, never mind giving them a round of applause. You know, our government asked us to go outside of our homes and applaud them. So, like, it would happen all the time. People would just go outside of their homes and just sort of applaud and whack pans together. Why? What's that going to do? Like, they need more money, more wages, more doctors, more nurses. What's this good? And the reason why the government asked them to do that is to keep you quiet. Because then, when they, when they in a few years down the line, the government knows the NHS will come back for the bill and say, listen, we kept you going during the pandemic, give us some more money so we're not going to be, you know, run ragged again if this happens again. And they won't do it. The government will say, no, we don't want to give you that money. And... The NHS will say, well, we'll go to the people then. The people will say, well, we did our bit. We applauded you outside of our house, right? That kind of attitude. That's why I don't normally do uh, mental health awareness months or things like that. Um, I do Movember because um, it's a, a cause very, very close to my heart. But um, I don't usually do it because um, I kind of got the, the, how do I put it? The attitude of Mr. Pink from, you know, Reservoir Dogs. Now look, if you put that to a vote and I'll vote for it, give me give me a, a, a you know a brochure that I sign that says the government shouldn't do that and I'll sign it. But what I, but what I won't do is play ball, right? And that's why I don't really like I don't like live aid. I don't like things like that. Why do these millionaires and billionaires seem to think it's okay to ask me to give money to charity when they? Do you know what I mean? No, it's cheeky. It's horrible. Have you ever gone to the supermarket? This turned into a rant already, but I guess a rant's are good for us every now and again. Have you ever gone to the supermarket and, you know, you pay £9.20 or something, and then the supermarket checkout kiosk, the self-checkout kiosk says, oh, do you want to round this up to £10 and give that ATB to charity? No, Tesco, I don't, because you're worth £500 million and I'm not. Why don't you just... Dude, I, I just can't stand it, you know. Ring the poor to go and give money to the poor. No, you do it. You've got all the money. Anyway, rant aside about economics, uh, we're here to discuss mental health. <laughs> and as you can see, right, I am not always on an even keel. I am not easy to live with. I am no day at the beach. I know, you say, North, you shock me. Um, uh, but there we go. Um... So I thought it'd be good to come on here as a hobby adjacent video. We are a, a channel that very proudly espouses our right to good mental health. And I, I try and help you guys out as and when I can when it comes to mostly young men who are on this channel. There are 99.2% of our viewers are men. So forgive me ladies for, or lady, whoever is watching, for talking to the to the young men and, and, and for, for, you know, trying to get some answers from them, them on what mental health means to them. But here we are. Um, if you're struggling, I, again, I'm going around the houses here because this is not a scripted video and this is a very hard thing to talk about. So if you are struggling, okay, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Feel free to use this channel as a rock by which you cling to in a storm, right? If you are literally on your way out, you're on your last leg, you've had some really bad news and you're already circling the drain, if all you've got to look forward to are these videos, then do that. 
put the weight on it. I can take it. Right? I can take the pressure. Just look out for the videos if you need to get them out every single day for you to get to the next day. Because I, I know... I know that this is basically scaffolding that goes around your life. Right? I'm a part of the scaffolding that goes around your life to keep your life from falling down. When a house, in terms of, we've used this analogy before on the channel, right? When a house crumbles and breaks and shatters and falls, that's basically you giving up and self-deleting, right? When the house crumbles and it's gone, right? And it rots away. 40k and your hobbies and your friends should be the scaffolding that goes around that house to keep it sturdy. You shouldn't always need the scaffolding, you know? Um, I don't mean get rid of your friends. What I mean is that, that you shouldn't need them to pick up the slack of keeping you alive, you know, for a, for a good uh, a period of time. But now and again, you need scaffolding. What I'm saying to you is, if you need me to be scaffolding constantly, every single day, then fucking use the channel that way. Use the Discord that way. Okay? That's what you need. If that's what you need to do, that's what we're here to do. Um, again, I'm not here to espouse about the hobby today. I'm here to talk to you about mental health and certain times where I perhaps have been suffering from, from mental health issues. I, I will be bluntly honest with all of you guys in that this channel and making it and, and going beyond it and, and meeting you guys and talking to you guys and, and, and doing these hobby nightmares has really been a force for good in my life it has been a force of of nearly nearly 100 percent good again there have been times where i've had stressful days that have not been nice you know what i mean and um there have been days when i've gotten hate on the internet but that, that that's the internet for you you know what i mean and eventually you start to realize hey these guys can't touch me they don't know me you know so so go fuck yourselves essentially um it has been a force for good in my life, and I hope that we've been able to turn that around on you a at least a little bit, and you guys can start to form your own good times in life uh, uh, due to the due to the hobby. I, I get told all the time that you know, uh, when I say all the time, maybe once or twice a week, um, not all the time, but you know what I mean. That you know the, the channel has helped people, and and it's and it's gotten people to to improve themselves, to go into the gym, to go to to you know to, to lose weight and to, to, to wear proper clothes and to get themselves smelling nice and looking nice and those people now have, have girlfriends I've, I've got people give me updates all the time there's even a young man who keeps sending me half naked pictures of himself in the gym which is all righty then but you know it, it, it he wants to show his progress and it's fine i just i dread to think what will happen with my when my missus comes in and i'm opening discord and looking at pictures like that but you, you know what i mean Mm. my main point here is is that if you need to use the channel as that bit of oomph as that fuel or even as that rock to cling to so you don't get swept away even as that bit of scaffolding that's just about keeping your house up then fine use the channel that way please don't think that i'm going to be mortified by the fact that you know there's somebody out there that if i don't upload a video it might send them over the edge no i will always upload a video right and I will tell you in advance when I'm not going to. You know that, that, that that's because I know how mental health um, how mental health works. I know that if you if I just leave you hanging, that could be the thing that sends you over the jet over the edge, and I'm not prepared to do that. Uh, this Friday, for instance, I might not be releasing a video because I'll be driving most of the day, right? And normally I need an hour or two to record, and then it, it, it uploads for an hour or two. So I don't know whether I'm going to be able to do one on Friday. But I'm saying that now, right? I might not be able to. Um, there will also be an announcement on the channel too. But most days, you know, Monday to Friday is your Hobby Nightmares Day or your Northern Exile Day where you get to, even if you feel like you don't have a friend, you can watch my videos and say, look, you know, here's a guy that even though I can't speak back to him, it sounds like we're in a bar shooting the shit, talking about hobby and having a laugh together about memories that people are sending us to read and that to me is what this this entire thing was always supposed to be when i started off i had in my head a 
there was a part of Bill Burr's podcast where he would read advice, you know, you know uh, requests for advice from viewers, and they'd be the funniest parts of the show because he, he was just ad libbing and going off the top of his head and using his own humor to to just get that out there. And I thought, you know, I started off with my own stories just to let people know what I was looking for, you know. So I started off talking about things that I that happened to me at Games Workshop that I went through in my life. And then eventually other people, because I shared first, other people started to share with me. And that's always what I've, what I've wanted to do. And that's what I've always wanted Hobby Nightmares really to be. And eventually we've grown it into this thing where we share our tales about the hobby that we love so much. Um, and we share what you think, you know, our triumphs and our tragedies and all, of, all the things in between that make the hobby such a, a, a wonderful place to be in. Um, and by a hobby, I mean wider geekdom. You know, I don't always do Warhammer stuff. Sometimes we do video games. Sometimes we do uh, role-playing sessions on Discord or whatever we we do videos on. They're always there. They're always there for you to have a little laugh to, and to have a a good old old good old yarn over. Um, but bear in mind, you know, I, I know full well how mental health goes. Okay, so a few years ago. Uh, when I came back from America, now, 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 see, this is what time does. Time, time being a great healer is true because when I think back to that time and how distraught I was about how my life just wasn't going anywhere and, and what the fuck do I do now? When I think back to that time now, it's like it's through a haze. It's like it's kind of through a haze and I can't really touch it. You know, the pain used to be so real. Now it's just. A miasma that's the you know it's some sort of a shadow of a memory of pain that I used to have um you know I, I I'd had that break up in the US and to come home and it wasn't so much through therapy I, I soon realized I just thought I was heartbroken but I soon realized that that had not really a lot to do with it you know the relationship was over way before the relationship ended we just weren't right for each other right and I think you know when you're over somebody, and I've said this to other people, when they go, well, how do I know when it's over? When you wish the best for your ex, even when it's not with you, that's when you're over them. Right? That's when you know. When you wish the best for your ex, and you hope she has all the kids, and, and has, the, has the, the life that she wanted with you, but you but with somebody else, and you wish that for her, that's when you know you're over her. That's it. Right? You just you, she She's nothing to you now, because you wanted to do well. Well, I felt that way for a couple of years now. And, you know, through therapy, I slowly realized that, oh, wait, you know, it wasn't the heartbreak that was getting me down. It was the fact that my life had reset again. Now, my life, as all of you, well, some of you may know, um, has reset a lot of times. I, I, I've been a lot of things in life. Um... You know, starting out from school, going into working in a, a lawyer's office as an office body, and then becoming a barman and running a bar, you know. Then going to university, getting a degree, coming out, working the games workshop. Natural trajectory there, I know, I suppose. <laughs> and then finishing games workshop and going eventually into teaching. Um, so my life's been all about the place, you know. I worked for construction companies when I was younger as well. I would basically, in my years of working, from the ages of 17 to about 24, 25, I was a gopher. I, if you paid me, I'd do it, essentially. If you wanted me to labor on a bricklayer, I would do it. If you wanted me to go um, work on an allotment with a friend of mine, I'd do it. I'd transport things. I would, I would you know, eventually I, I, I'd... I'd do bar work and I'd run bars and I'd, I'd do all sorts of things um, just to get money to drink with <laughs> that's literally what I did I was living at home with my parents you know I was a young man I was earning my money they, they were they were they were waiting for me to find my way in the world and it's only now recently when I've gotten older that I've realized just how patient they were and how lucky I was to have you know a, a family there who actually put up with that shit <laughs> and let me just find myself right because um, if that was me, I'd be really pissed off if my 18-year-old son was like, well, I'm just going to stay here now, rent-free, and uh, work in a bar and get laid every weekend. Okay, great, cool. Where's your career? Oh, I don't have one. <laughs> right, you know, that kind of thing would really annoy me. 
Um, so they were really, really patient, and they allowed me to find myself. But I think my mum uh, sees a lot of my uncle in me. Like, my uncle didn't really flower as a man until he was, like, well into his 30s. And then he, he got the job that earned him a lot of money. Um, you know, and, and, and did really, really, really well for himself. Um... And she always thought I'd be a late bloomer. She's always said, like, you know, you, you will you will screw around until you're in your thirties, and then you'll just come good, because that's what we do. That's what our family does. All of the men, you know, even even your, even your granddad, who was a bricklayer all of his life, still screwed around in his twenties as he was laying bricks. Right, he only became a proper family man in his thirties and, and and got his shit together. So, I guess that that was the natural way of order of things. But uh, you know, they were very 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 patient with me. And eventually, coming out of university was the the quintessential. You know, I remember sitting at, sitting inside Durham Cathedral, right? And I'm sitting inside Durham Cathedral in a pair of chinos and a shirt. Why? Um, because I'd ripped my trousers that morning and was super pissed off. That I'd done that. I was the only one there in chinos. Now, bear in mind, at a normal university, wearing a nice pair of chinos with a shirt isn't such a fashion faux pas, right? Let's not be... Yeah, it's fine. It is what it is. At Durham, Durham isn't just an elite university. Durham's an elite university that has a chip on its shoulder, right? Uh, in Oxford or Cambridge, they'd laugh off the fact that you're in chinos. They'd take the piss and move on. Because they're, they're very secure in who they are. Durham is like that really insecure person who's really good at something, but is very easily offended. And uh, boy, were they offended with me wearing wearing chinos. Until I went, walked over to Bill Bryson, shook his hand, and he, and he said, Ah, chinos. Bloody good choice. It's bloody boiling, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is, Bill. Thank you. And then, you know... And off I went to do my to do my thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I yeah, it, it, it was just really, 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 really a good day. But sitting back and looking at, at the university, like the the lights, I sat back down again, and he made another joke at my expense about the chinos, which you know people laughed at. My family were mortified, obviously, but you know it is what it is. And I'm looking up and I'm trying to think about. What's going to happen now? Because for the last four or five years, this university has been my life. It's sort of been like a chrysalis. Because before this, I was just fucking around. I was in, you know, bars and doing other bits of work and, you know, sleeping around and, 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 and generally having fun. But now I'm looking around going, right, what do I do now? What do I do now? You know? I mean, I had a girlfriend at the time who was from uh, California, and we were going really well. And I was like, oh, am I going to move over there? Like, what's going to happen there? Like, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. And it was kind of when I realized, okay, this is coming to an end, and I'm being thrown into the sea now. It's sink or swim time. And as he was giving a speech, he was like, you know, you know, Bill, Bill Bryson was like, oh, well, you guys, don't, don't worry, you know, you're never going to be alone. You're always going to have your, your, your family, your, your Durham family here to support you. And I just thought to myself, yeah, but no, <laughs> that's not what's going to happen, is it? We're going to go out into the big wide world and what the fuck's going to happen? And I was lost. When I finished university, I was lost. And uh, when I got that job at King's Workshop, people don't really understand why I moved. I moved across country for that job, right? People don't really get why I moved. I moved because I was desperate. Right? I'd finished university. Things weren't really working out. I wasn't really getting the jobs that I wanted. And, you know, a, a doing a master's degree would be a lot of money. So I didn't know what to do. So I went to Games Workshop. Uh, I, and I got a job at Games Workshop. And, in essence, it kind of worked out well. Because with Games Workshop, it um, allowed me to not think what if do you know what I mean because I've always wanted to work for Games Workshop I've always wanted to work in the hobby I've always wanted to be one of those guys in the store I've always wanted to be somebody working within that sphere and now I, I, I know exactly what it's like working for Games Workshop it's fucking shit but, but 
but now I know, right? Now I know. I, and I was there there for, for a while and, you know, had some really good memories from it, had some really bad memories from it. But the one thing that Games Workshop did for me, like for, for my life, was give me the memories and the stories and the contacts to build something like this for other people. I think that's the main reason why I I got uh, I got to do, I, uh, well I, I look back at it as, as not a bad thing anymore. All right, when uh, I first started this channel, oh boy, did I have an axe to grind. You know, in terms of mental health, oh boy, um, <laughs> did I have my hard on for Games Workshop. Uh, I hated their fucking guts and and. Uh, I really did go after them. I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I hate these guys. I really, really, really cannot tell you how much I hate these guys because they, they just ruined my hobby and devastated me and made me not want to do jack shit when I left. Um, luckily for me, and this is one of those moments where, you know, I want you to, to take away. That there, there are two transcendent moments one happened to me and the other one happened to somebody else and i'm going to tell you about both of them now um just when if you think you're hitting the bottom of the barrel right if you think you're on the way out which i have done a few times like i i can't think much more of this i can't even take no more right i've been there more than once the only reason i'm still here guys is because i'm too much of a coward to do anything to myself i don't like the idea of hurting myself i don't like the idea of destroying my body right i i as much as i don't like me sometimes i my body hasn't done anything wrong do you, know, do you know what i mean like like my body could be used by somebody else um i don't know like even taking pills it, it, it's never sat right with me um you know never really been my thing so you know i i, I that's the only reason why i'm here is because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a coward and i've never wanted to do it um but i also think that on the flip side of of, of that proviso there is i often think staring into that abyss and knowing without a shadow of a doubt it'd be much easier for you to just kill yourself but stepping back from it and saying nah fuck this fuck this you're not getting you're not getting me you're not getting me you can't i'm gonna kick you right in the fucking balls e even if i even if i don't make anything of my life i'm going to make you watch me live my life you, you can fuck off i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do it right that is a much braver decision a lot of the time than actually just taking your own life for me um that's my philosophy when it comes to to suicide right it, it, it's a lot braver to look into that abyss and know it, it'll be all over and it's fine you know and to take that step back i've often said i'll get to those two transcendent moments in a, in a minute i promise but um, I've often said that the morning that my relationship in America broke down um, and they, they left me alone in the house just to stew, essentially. That's the closest I've ever come to, to killing myself. That's the closest I've ever come. Very, very, very close. Um, and I've said this before. I, I'm a bit of a coward. I don't like hurting myself. But if somebody, let's say the devil... I'd come to me at that moment and said, listen, here is a switch. If you flick this switch, um, everything goes black, right? And you would never have existed. So nobody's going to be hurt by you not being around. There was a good half an hour span in that morning from around 10 past 10 to around quarter to 11 where I would have flicked it without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and I'm really glad there was no firearm there or bottle of pills or you know because I, I i would have thought about it I, I was i was that in despair that even the thought of hurting my family was kind of at the back of my mind not the front because I, I literally thought i was a burden to them i literally thought well you know my life you know going to america and becoming a teacher and getting married was my happy ending right it was the thing that was supposed to make me okay it was the thing that was supposed to make me not a burden to my family anymore and for that to fail out of the blue like that i couldn't take another reset 
I didn't feel like I could take another reset. And I didn't feel like me being around was what was good for my family. Right? So that's the closest I've ever come to doing that. And eventually... Um... I don't know why why I, I didn't do it. I, well, I, I didn't have it, I didn't have any means to hand, to be honest with you. Um, so <laughs> I think after a while, I kind of calmed, didn't calm down, but I sort of got a, a, a smidgen of my senses back, and I called my mother. And she was the first person I called. And um, she told me since, this is years later she told me this, she said, that's the most haunting phone call I think I've ever had. That was horrible. Like, don't get me wrong, I was so distraught for you. But that was... You know... Eventually, when I eventually told her that I'd come close to killing myself, she was like, I know. She said, I know. Like, it, it, it's... You couldn't receive a phone call like that. Because I wasn't wailing. I wasn't crying. You know? Um... And she stopped me at the, near the end of the phone call and said, listen, um, just go for a walk for me, right, in the park, because she knows there's no traffic. She knows the area where I was in, in America. Go for a walk in the park um, and a video video call your sister, you know, video call your sister as you're walking. Um, but please don't, don't try and make this a goodbye phone call for me. If you need it, just know you'll absolutely break my heart. Please don't do that to me. And that's what pulled me back. And people can see that as a selfish thing for her to say. I don't. I, I honestly think that, that she made the right call in like saying, look, you know, I know this ain't good for you. I know this isn't what, what you want. But, you know, she reassured me that you're not, you're not a failure in my eyes. You tried everything that you could do to make that thing work. You know, you've, got, you've, you've flown over the other side of the world, for God's sake chasing a job you know you're giving everything up for this other person and she's pulled up the rug from under you that's not your fault that's not your fault you need to just you know you, you need to give yourself some credit and hearing that sort of took away the guilt not not all of it but took away some of the guilt of oh okay maybe I'm not as big of a burden as I thought maybe, maybe people just love me unconditionally you know, and the the voice in my head telling me to to off myself sort of went away then, and I was able to start the rebuilding process. Um, so that was one of I guess it's three transcendent transcendent moments that have stopped me from harming myself or or, or um, doing something that drastic. But the other two I want to talk about. One of them didn't happen to me. It happened to my friend Simon. Um, but the the first one did happen to me, and um, this is not something that stopped me from killing myself, but it was something that really turned my life around. And it was me going for a pint with my grandpa. Now, uh, anybody who has met my grandpa, of which there is a few of you, will know the kind of uh, guy he is. Um, he is essentially an old school uh, scouse bricklayer, uh, <laughs> um, and I think the term man's man has come up more than once. Like, he, he's a very... He's no-nonsense. Um, extremely honest to a fault. Um, and he's just, just an extremely loyal person. And, and everybody that knows him in the local area... He's sort of a legend. Like, when he eventually he does pass away, touch wood, not soon. But eventually when he does pass away, like, there'll be a, a funeral there with maybe a thousand, two thousand people at it. I'm not exaggerating. That's literally how well he's known in our local area as being a top, top man. And I went for a pint with him. And he just looked at me. And we'd just seen Everton beat Chelsea 2-1. And he looked at me and just went, What are you doing, son? I said, well, What do you mean? He said, You're working in a bar again? I said, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's earning some money, you know. I said, You shouldn't be doing that. You've always been good at, well, you never, you never fucking shut up. You know, you should, you're good at history. You're good at talking. You should be a teacher. And I don't know why it had never occurred to me. I honestly don't know why. Maybe I thought I could never do it in in England or or, or, or whatever. Um, this is before the American thing, by the way. So maybe I thought I could never do it. 
but that's what started me on the path to yes the, the the america thing was a false start but again teaching wasn't teaching got me into my current job and it got me into uh, in a little bit having the confidence to do youtube right so that one talk of him sitting me down and saying listen you should do this bang automatically i started i had a light at the end of the tunnel again i had something to aim for and i speak about this all the time having something to aim for it's probably the A1 thing you should be doing in life if you are somebody who is struggling with mental health. Having that one thing to aim for, having that thing where you're like, okay, I'm going to be this, or I'm going to do this. Don't get too married to it because you never know what's going to go on in life. But having an aim, having an end goal is incredibly healthy. And as soon as I had that, I had meaning. And that's why the America thing falling apart was so devastating because it ripped away that end goal, that meaning, right? Um, eventually i found another one um and it was you guys <laughs> so there you go um the other the other story i wanted to talk about was a friend of mine this is a bit more of a spiritual story um i i i don't know whether i whether i should give it in detail of where he was at the time um no i won't okay so he was Essentially, uh, uh, my friend, my friend Simon was at the end of his rope, at the end of his tether, and he had had enough. Essentially, and he'd been struggling with depression uh, since about the age of 13, 14. He'd been diagnosed as bipolar, and he literally couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle life. So he went to hang himself. Now, he went to his local park, as you do. And climbed a tree and, and he, he researched how to do it and he was very calm about it and he said weirdly he was much happier in the few days before doing that right um than, than he'd ever been in before in his life because he, he, he knew the pain was going to end you know so he went up the tree and, he, and he's sitting there and he's got the got the noose ready and he puts it around his neck and he's sitting in the tree getting ready trying to psych himself up to do it going, okay pain's gonna be over it's gonna be awesome Okay, cool. And then beneath him, uh, two girls who were just playing and he hadn't seen, right, ran past the bottom of the tree. And he went, oh, fuck. Right? Because there were houses kind of nearby, but he was in a secluded spot of the woods. You know what I mean? Like, you weren't going to be found for a while. And he was like, oh, fuck. They're going to be the first ones to find me here. So he very gingerly took the noose from around his neck left it there and climbed down and went to look for them to make sure they weren't around and he said he took it took him like an hour and a half of walking around and he was like yeah they're not here like there was there was nobody there like they, they'd either sprinted off or done something I don't, I don't know i don't know where they'd gone they were hiding somewhere so he decided if they are hiding around i can't do it because they might come back so he left he left the noose where it was and he left and um, he, he went off and, and went back home and, and eventually um, woke up the next day and and then woke up the next day and the next day and the next day and eventually by hook or by crook his life turned around and he got better um, I think he, he got a, he got a new job at a new school and essentially started working there and really loved it and and away he went and, and he said he's never really had those thoughts ever again and this is a few years ago now when I went to visit him in Wales, um, he took me to that spot. He took me to that tree. And the noose is no longer there, but but the, the tie around that he'd made is still there. So, so the, the he, he cut it off because he didn't want it, you know, but the, the tie around he made is still there on the tree. Um, and yeah, this is after I got back from America. So he wanted to show me something that, you know, he was like, look, if, if you think you, you're, you're not going to make it, come and look at this, right? I thought I wasn't going to make it. And that one random act of those girls running beneath my tree stopped me from doing the ultimate. Because I was going to do it. I was sitting in the fucking tree. Right? And now look at me. You know, I'm, I'm a year, I'm head of year at my school. I'm doing really well. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged to be married to a woman who's really good. And you will get there in the end. You know, the, the, only, the only decision you can't come back from is killing yourself. That's the one thing I want you to think about. The only decision 
The only one you cannot come back from is killing yourself. That's it. Okay? That's literally it. Every other decision, every other thing you ever do in life, you can come back from. Killing yourself, you can't. It's, it, it's, it's the one thing. The, literally the only option that you take that there are no take-backs. That's it. And the amount of people that I read about... There, there's one guy who sent me a letter and didn't want me to read it out on, on the channel. But it, I, I guess me talking about it is, is vague enough. And this is a guy who attempted to kill himself and failed. Jumped off of a bridge, right? Into some water and failed. Broke both of his legs, but failed. And he told me that in his email that he, he literally came back to the surface. And his first thought was, Oh my god, the search are bad. Oh my god, the search are bad. Oh my fucking god. Oh my fucking days. Oh my fucking god, right? But beyond that, <laughs> his first thought was, Thank fuck I'm alive. And that really stuck with me. You know? That really, really stuck with me. Because he told me he was so sure that he wanted to die. He was so, so sure. You know? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm done. I've had enough. I mean, the guy jumped off a fucking bridge. Do you know what I mean? Like, he, he was sure. <laughs> like, if you, you, want a, you want sure... He was sure. Um, and the first thing he thinks of when he comes to the surface, you know, is, wow, I'm in pain, yeah, but thank fuck I'm alive, and the sky is very blue. Those are the three things that he remembered. He passed out. He, when he got to the shore, he passed out. He said, yeah, those are the three things I remembered. Right? That I'm in real pain here. And as he went into shock, he was like, I'm in real pain, Thank fuck I'm alive. I really hope I don't die. And the sky is very blue. Those were his three thoughts. And, you know, that, for somebody to be so sure, so sure, that their time has come to die, that they want to die, and then the first thing they do when they've jumped and when they come back to the surface is, oh, thank fuck I'm not dead. If nothing else stays your hand, that should. That should. Right? Because it's the only thing you can't take back. If it works, it's the only thing you can't take back. You know? And it's, it's the ultimate form of, of tragedy because um, it's not the answer. It just it just isn't. Right? Do you really think... Let's, let's think back to somebody tortured like Kurt Cobain. Right? Let's look at Kurt Cobain. Guy blew his own fucking head off with a shotgun. Do you really think that that a Kurt Cobain in his same mind, right, thought, yeah, I made the right choice there. Yeah, leaving my kid without a father, yeah, that was the right choice. Right? Do you really think that that's what it... Because I don't. I don't. I, I think if there is an afterlife... I think the first thing you would do once you've killed yourself is try to undo the fact that you killed yourself. I honestly do. I honestly feel that the first thing you do after suicide, if, if souls are a thing and the afterlife is a thing, the first thing you do is to try and undo that you've killed yourself. You try and bargain with God or, or the, the prime mover or the universe or whatever it is to get your life back. I truly believe that. I truly, truly believe that. Okay. So just if you've ever thought about making that ultimate decision, just know. And that's the only one you can't come back from. Once you've done it, you leave behind a trail of devastation. And even if you don't care about that, I swear to you, if it doesn't work out, like if you wake up afterwards, you'll be like, oh my god, thank fuck that didn't work. Oh my days, thank fuck that didn't work. That's what you'll think. So, that is my video on Mental Health Month. I thought that I should do one because of the focus of the channel. Um, hopefully, you get what you need out of it. 
and things go well for you and, and, and you have a wonderful, wonderful time on the channel and, and, and you're in the hobby and stuff. Um, this was more of a crisis video, like if, if shit is about to hit the fan, do you know what I mean? It was very ranty and ravey, I know, but yeah, I don't know. So, I love you all a long time. I will speak to you very, very, very soon. Uh, maybe tomorrow for some more Hobby Nightmares, but if not, because I'm busy and I'm driving, then at least you've got this video to see you through the weekend, alright? Be very safe, be very good. And I'll speak to you soon, alright? Love you a long time. See you soon. Bye now.